So tonight, though, we are really all about Tessa. So Tessa Smith McGovern is co-founder <laughs> of the Fairfield County Writers Studio. She's the host of Book Girl TV, and she's an award-winning writer whose many publication credits include the Connecticut Review and the English Arts Council of the South Bank Center, London. Her link story collection, London Road Link Stories, is an Amazon bestseller and a gold medal winner at the 2012 ELIT Awards. And her nonfiction book, Cocktails for Book Lovers, very irresistible, um, is also an Amazon bestseller. Tess is the founder and editor of Each of Digital Publishing, publisher of stories and memoirs on iPhone, iPad, Android, Nook, and Kindle. And each have won a silver medal at the 2012 ELIT Awards, and the stories have been read by thousands of readers in 100 plus countries. Book Girl TV has over 6 million minutes viewed on YouTube, 600 subscribers, and is partnered with Disney's Maker Gen Studios, and an app called Book, TV, Book Girl TV Buzz is available on Android and iOS. So we're so pleased tonight to have Hatessa here. I'm going to turn things over to her. Thanks so much, Kelly. This is really fabulous of the Westport Library to put together and to, to have people with computers and selling books. And um, So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. And Aileen, too, who's there, who's right there, who organized the whole thing so, and also did that fantastic gift basket. It's really something else. So, and thank you to, to local authors, but nevertheless, national recognition here too. We are, we are incredibly fortunate in Connecticut to have the talent that we have, um, and I will be introducing them shortly. So a little bit of background, I was born in Surrey in England in 1963, and um, my mom lives here with me and has done for 23 years, although we did have a, a little bit of a checkered past, I will say. Uh, but she's the person who, uh, I'm sure like all of you, you had that person who made you a reader, made you a writer. And she used to sit on the floor reading her book, and I could not get her attention. Mom! Mom! And she just, she was gone. She was off in a different world. And every now and then she would stop and she would say, oh, listen to this. And she would read a sentence from the book that she was reading because it was so beautiful. Um, and so I think, you know, probably I'm permanently writing to get her attention. <laughs> Doesn't change. Um, she used to read so much that when my dad came home, she would take her bookmark out of her book and put it earlier in the book so he couldn't tell how much she'd been reading. <laughs> and he was an ex-RAF guy, so the first thing he did when he came in was run his finger along the shelf to see if she dusted it. So she used to dust that one shelf, <laughs> and that was it. Um, so we, we were fortunate, you know, my brother and I were big readers. She took us to the library every week until I was about 12, when uh, my parents divorced and I was sent to boarding school. And then my mom, um, after the divorce, she bought a bed and breakfast uh, in actually in Croydon, where we were born. You know Croydon? <laughs> Center of the universe, right? Look it up, it's very, what shall I say? It's, it's not an elegant place. It's um, a changing environment. It's a changing environment, <laughs> yes. Let's call it that. Um, so they were hard days for my mom. She was working hard, she was trying to get over the divorce, she was always worried about money. And then in around 1975, when I was, um, 15, something changed. And that something was that Margaret Thatcher's government instituted a policy called Care in the Community, which was where they closed all the psychiatric hospitals and released the patients into bed and breakfasts like ours. So what that meant was I would come back from boarding school on exiats or half terms or summer holidays and I had a room at the top of the house and it was a big, like a massive Victorian house, and actually there were two of them side by side. I was not a very understanding or tolerant teenager. You know, I was, a, I was a brat. I wasn't as bad as some of the kids, some of the girls, and it was a convent boarding school, so we had girls 
climbing out of the window to see boys. I wasn't that, that wasn't my thing, but, um, you know, I was just like a bratty teenager and um, I didn't have much tolerance or understanding. But I remember still to this day the kindness that my mom had. And I think that's probably why we were always full. People came and they stayed, which was not what I wanted, but they came and they stayed. Um, and, and I suppose money-wise, you know, it was good. She was able to make a living. Um, there are stories. These stories are actually inspired by those times. And the landlady who was in this collection, who's called Nora, is inspired by my mom. And, and quite a lot of it is true. And I will tell you that my mom years ago gave me permission to say and write anything I wanted. <laughs> if you don't remember that, mom, you did. <laughs> she did. So the same thing was happening in the US. Reagan did the same thing. Um, it was called Care and Ward over here. And it wasn't until the 1980s that it A, became public, and B, became clear how disastrous a program it was. One of the stories is called Isabel, and it's almost word for word what happened. Um, although, you know, much of it is inspired by, but made up. Um, this was actually the sister of a very famous English designer in New York who is still famous. In, and if you read in the um, information, you'll find out who it is. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say it. Um, so she was a very tall, um, very glamorous, but sort of scary. She looked like a, a scary doll. She used to wear a lot of makeup. <laughs> Um, and she would always give me a, a hairy eyeball when I came home. She did not like me at all. I mean, I didn't know why. She used to follow my mother around from room to room, and, and Mum was always kind to her, which, um, you know, now I look back and I think that really was not easy. But, um, and, and for the fiction writers amongst us, when you put a character under pressure and then you see how they behave, she was always kind to them. Um, but anyhow, this girl had actually stabbed her mother, which is what got her into the hospital. Um, and so I used to go back to school, you know, looking at this girl thinking, leave my mother alone, you know, just, just leave her, because she was obsessed with my mom. So it was a very weird, um, fascinating time. Just a little bit of background is that I first published my first short story in 96, and then just kept submitting, you know, I would, again, for those of you who are writers, I would submit 100 times, Lawrence, 100 times before I deemed a story was not publishable. Um, really, 100 times, and, and so I did get quite a lot of stories published, and then I also got a job writing for a magazine called BC the Magazine, 1,500 word stories every other month. And so I did that for nine years. So I wrote about 60 short stories. Um, so it was a lot of writing over time. And then when I came in, in 2008, the market tanked. And I thought, well, if I haven't got a publisher to publish my novel yet, let me see what I can do with it. Um, and I hired freelance editors, but found that in those 60 stories, I had some that really hung together pretty well, because you know, just naturally, I'd been writing about it. And they, they sort of made a coherent whole. So, um, so then some of you know that after I published my own, I then had the intellectual property for this app. It was an iPhone app originally, um, and Android. And so I thought, well, let me, I know so many talented writers, let me, let me publish that. Um, and so that's how each of came to pass. And none of these things I did all at the same time, by the way, it was like two years for each of and then two years for Book Girl TV. Um, and Book Girl TV, which is um, how this book came to pass, was really born because video was everywhere. And I thought, oh my god, you know, people are not reading, they're stopping reading. Everybody who is to do, is a writer, to do with books, we have to get on video. And I still do believe that. I think that we need more people, you know, putting your videos out about your books and about your writing, because we have to be, books have to be omnipresent. Um, but the good news is that people are reading more than ever, so that's actually a lovely thing. Um, so I'm going to go back to London Road Link Stories, but just to sort of finish the trajectory. Um, in 2013, my father, who'd been suffering from Alzheimer's for a couple of years, died, and I couldn't write. And so then, so that's partly why I did Book Girl TV, because I could focus on other people's stories and I could 
think and write and say things about their stories. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's, I think, the reason it was cocktails is because my dad used to bring champagne cocktails. I would go down and visit him, and in England, you know, it's different. You get alcohol from like the time you're very small. So, 15, 16, 17, I would turn up, um, and he would make these champagne cocktails. Wickedly strong, now I think about it. Champagne with brandy, a glob, you know, like glug, glug, glug of brandy, and then a sugar cube. And he would put these on a silver tray, and he would bring them out to the garden with such a look of, it's a party, you know, everybody <laughs> just so delighted. That was his thing. He loved, he just loved people and he loved drinking and he loved parties and, you know, at first I was angry at him because I thought if you'd taken better care of yourself, you know, maybe you would have lived longer and, and better, you know, towards the end. But now I think he had a blast. He was doing what he wanted. He had a blast. I would say that in the back of the collection there is um, another sort of file called Memoir or Fiction, that's its title, and that gives you more of the background to some of these stories and some of these characters if you'd like to read more about that. Um, and there are, it's very short, there are seven stories, um, and I think my favorite one is The Literature Group, which is number two. And this came from something I read in the newspaper. This is a good program that existed in England and America, because they very often copy each other, and then you never know quite where does it start. But um, So this is a program that people who were arrested would be assigned to a literature group instead of getting time. And, and it, it works, you know? It actually works. It's, if you Google it, um, you'll see that both programs are still going, they're still successful, and I know we don't need any evidence as to why reading is good for us, but it's really a delightful thing. So this is called The Literature Group. So she says to me, Mandy, I have great faith in you. I know you'll make a go of this. Probation is so much better than jail, isn't it? And I think, bloody right it is. And I give her my biggest, brightest smile, and she peers at me over her small, red-framed glasses. And she's got these warm, blue eyes that are like, no matter what, you, what you've done, I'll like you anyway. Her gray fringe has a gap, and her forehead is shiny with sweat. Her shoulder-length hair is thin, and I bet she's had that hairstyle her whole life. She pours tea for her, me, and the two guys sitting silently across the table. One is black, one is white, both wear gray hooded sweatshirts. I notice a pack of chocolate wafers in her bag. The thing is, she says, we're going out on quite a limb here. It's experimental, this literature group. And if we're successful, you know, if no one gets rearrested, we'll keep our funding and it'll be so good for everyone who comes after you. That obviously matters to her, so I nod. So do the two guys. They've seen the wafers too. <laughs> This short story is called The Garden Party, and I think it's a nice choice for a lovely hot summer day like today. It's by a writer called Catherine Mansfield, and we're just going to read it and see what you think, okay? Mandy, why don't you do the honors while I read, she says, handing me the pack of wafers. So she starts reading, and her voice is sort of hip hypnotic, like being back in junior school, which I quite enjoyed before Mum passed, but then I couldn't stand it. I start to empty the wafers onto the stained white saucer, my cup of tea was sitting in, and the two pigs opposite grab the lot. She notices but doesn't say anything, so I keep hold of what's left and eat the rest of them, one by one, and they're crispy and delicious. As she's reading, I can see the garden being set up for the party and the pink lilies and the girl in her hat who goes to visit the dead man's widow, a complete stranger living in a hovel, until suddenly she says, the end. That's it for this week. Your assignment is to read the story again and think about it, and next week share your thoughts, okay? And there are no wrong or right answers in this group, okay? Whatever your opinion is, is the right response. The guys are already halfway out the door. Please remember, she calls, attendance is mandatory or we can reconsider custodial sentences. She picks up her blue file. I know what it says in there about me. Mother died, alcoholic stepfather, burn marks on arms, ran away from home at age 14. Not everything is in there, though. 
If she knew I lit a fire under his bed in the middle of the night, she might not smile so much. I want to ask, do people still have garden parties? But I don't want to look stupid, so instead I say, same time next week? And she nods, looking over those red glasses and says, stay away from old friends and old haunts, all right, Mandy? And that's where she loses me because she hasn't got a clue. She thinks I'll get caught, but in all the time I've been on my own, 14 to 29, what's that, 15 years? In all that time, I've only been caught once because I'm good. And not just good, I'm the best. That evening, I buy a kebab and a six-pack of Heineken. I'm sitting on my bed in my new room, back against the wall, reading the story, and Isabel and Bitty down below start fighting. I'm trying to concentrate, but their voices get louder and I have to keep starting at the beginning again. I'm rereading the bit about how lovely the garden looks before the party, and then there's a massive thump that makes the wall against my back vibrate and I jump half out of my skin. Isabel screams, Bitty, you're not pretty! And Bitty shouts back, and I rip the door open and scream down the staircase, Will you shut the... Can I say this? <laughs> Will you shut the fuck up? Isabel storms into the hallway and grabs the banister, staring up at me with wild eyes. She's tall with fuzzy black hair and a bottle of beer in her free hand, but she doesn't scare me. She leans over and chucks up. Vomit splashes all over the thin brown and orange carpet. No wonder this place stinks. I give up trying to, it really did smell bad. I give up trying to read the rest of the story, grab my key in my bag and go out for a walk, past Esky Sports with its dirty metal shutters, past the jewelers and the packy shop and the kebab shop. And for six days, I make it just like that, no problem. Sleep late, go to the library where I sort of look for a job, but the social's good for months yet and my room's paid for too. So I surf the web looking at houses with big gardens for sale and I really am doing all right, keeping my nose clean, not even thinking about lifting, not one tiny thought about how simple it would be to knock off some stuff from the local jewelers and sell it in the black horse until the morning of my second lit group meeting. The guy on the radio says it's the hottest day on record in England. I wake up extra late, hungover, only half an hour to get ready before the bus. My room is sweltering. I open a window and even hotter air blows in. I get in the shower thinking about the garden party, about pretty clothes and how much fun it would be to live like that. And this feeling like, I don't know, a cyclone or whatever comes up inside me and I think it's not fair. I think it's not fair. Nothing's ever fair. Why shouldn't I have what I want? Why should I be the only one to have nothing my whole life? I want to be special. I want people to look at me and say, hey, who's that? I want to be someone. I throw my shorts and t-shirt and sneak down the stairs, don't need to bump into crazy Isabel, and tiptoe past the dining room. The fire door is open and in the kitchen at the back I see Nora making tea and another woman about the same age sitting at the pine table. There's a plate of biscuits there too. One day when no one's around, maybe I'll check out the cupboards in there. Now I'm on the street passing Esky Sports with its metal shutters on my way to the bus stop when I think, I don't know. Maybe the lit group is a waste of time. You can't eat or drink a story. I could say I was ill, I'd probably only get a warning. And if I did live, I'd lift, I wouldn't get caught. I'm too good. So I stop walking, and lo and behold, the handwritten sign on the... I'm outside Hatton Garden Jewelers, wondering why I can't see the old man, who usually sits behind the counter reading a newspaper. Then I see the handwritten sign on the door. Back in 10 minutes. I check my watch. It's 10 to 12, 10 minutes till the bus comes, 10 minutes till the old man comes back. I can get on the bus or wait for him and make a hit. I step back out of sight and my elbow hits the shutter of the sports shop, making it rattle. I step away. The shutter is covered with black bubble graffiti that says, fuck you. Above the building is empty blue sky. Somewhere a bird is singing and the traffic is light and it barely smells of exhaust fumes and it's a hot, perfect summer day. Words from the garden party pop into my head. They could not have had a more perfect day for a garden party if they had ordered it. Windless, warm, the sky without a cloud. Like summer when I was a kid, when things were easy. But what a cow that girl Laura in the story is. How stupid could you get? 
If I were in her shoes, I'd stay in the bloody garden and party. She didn't know when she was born. She wanted for nothing, and still she wasn't happy. And what a useless, brain-dead writer to write such a story. Look at me, world, she's saying. I'm rich, but look how sweet and sensitive I am. What a load of bollocks. The old man reappears. Not the easiest place to knock off a jeweler. It's not like hunting for untagged clothes or wearing them out of a clothes shop. But he's so old, I could definitely slip something off a tray without him noticing. And then I think of Mrs. Redglasses at the lid group, bringing the teapot to the table, checking her watch and hoping I'm just late. And I imagine walking in there and sitting down, telling her right to her face how stupid that short story was and why it made no sense in the real world. She'll be shocked, probably, when I say it's stupid except for the garden description, and if she doesn't agree with me, I'll throw her own, her own words right back in her face. There's no right or wrong answer. Whatever your opinion is, is the right response. I check my watch. Six minutes until the bus. I can make it if I get a move on. So I start running and I feel my heart jumping about like I'm sort of excited, but it's probably because I haven't run anywhere in God knows how long, but anyway, it feels good. And who knows, there could be chocolate wafers again. And this time, I'll get them first. The end. <laughs> the, the thing about stories to me is it's all about connecting. It's all about what you read that moved you. And you tell me, and I read it, and I see if it moves me too. And to that end, on the table there, I brought some copies of Banker by Anton Chekhov. So he wrote Vanka in 1886, and a guy in Russia, you know, way before I was born, someone, he was a doctor, I'm not a doctor, um, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who he was, the words on that page just always move me. It's one of my, I love it, it's one of my favorite stories, and so I hope that you might take a look at it too, and that it might, might reach you. And now, if I may, I'd like to introduce our local authors. We have really the most, like sitting at that table right there. My partner at the right, Fairfield County Writers Studio, FCWS. So we help beginning and emerging authors thrive and get to the next stage. And um, we have agents coming in. We have wonderful classes with wonderful teachers, some of whom are sitting here tonight. So, Carol is our first a journalist and editor. This is, these are very I can rich. read away, no You do, it's so super, awesome. super short. And, and forgive me for the rich bios, because just look them up, they have so much going on. Um, so, Carol's been nominated for three Emmys. She is a master teacher. She has a closet, closet full of awards. Um, and she teaches intermediate and advanced memoir writing and writing to prompts, non-fiction. Um, and then we have Sophronia Scott, please have a wave. Um, Sophronia has written for Time and People magazine, the New York Times.com and O the Oprah magazine. Her second novel, she has the first one here, but her second novel is called The Light Lives Here and it's being published by William Morrow in 2017, which is fantastic. <laughs> She's a memoir and essay, essay writing at FCWS. And Linda Lecters, in the white t-shirt there, wave your hand, Linda, um, has published in top journals including Glimmer Train, Alaska Quarterly Review, Calliope, and her novel, Connected Underneath, has just been published um, April of this year. Um, and she's been doing a blog tour and all kinds of exciting things. And she teaches a class called I Want to Write, Now What? at FCWS. <laughs> And then Ab Abby Vegas, um, in the blue, solid blue, mm -hmm. is a talented self-published author, an indie author, whose romantic suspense, Clean Break, is out now. And she has been featured on some great blogs, including usatoday.com, which is fabulous. Um, then we have Maggie Knight. Am I saying that properly? First time ever in my life. <laughs> Jen told me. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's German, right? So yeah, yeah. So um, 
Maggie is a veteran of the publishing industry, a career spanning 20 years um, with Bertelsmann and Scholastic, and she's the author of a memoir called Now Everyone Will Know, The Perfect Husband, His Shattering Secret, My Rediscovered Life. Pretty interesting, so over there on the table you can have a look. Um, Sally Allen, a resident blue stocking, has a PhD in English. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> yes, that's a, a literary lady. I mean, these are, you're all literary ladies, but she has a PhD in English education and an MA in English literature. She's the editor of Hamlet House Books, Inc., and the author of Unlocking Worlds, which she has over there, which is a distillation of many years of reading, which provides valuable knowledge for people looking to go beyond the Amazon review, so if you're looking for something a little deeper. Um, and even if you're not looking for a book, just an enjoyable read on its own. Um, Susan, <laughs> Susan Israel has been published in many excellent places, including Ladies Home Journal and The Washington Post. And she's the author of Student Bodies and Over My Live Body. Her novels are edgy and immediate, and she's been called one of crime fiction's most talented new voices. So if you like crime, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine, I am sorry, I do not know how to say your no, last name. Not too worried. Shall I say it for you? Yes, yeah. please. Can you forgive me now for that? <laughs> Say it again. Onyame Lukwe. Onyame. That's a part of the brain. Carol can do it. Carol can do it. I'm your partner. I got your back. You can. Yes. It's uh, Catherine Onyame Lukwe. Oh, she's showing off now. Oh, so this is Nigeria Revisited. A memoir, right? Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. So my life's and life and loves abroad. So you know, in the spirit of kicking off summer reading, it's I think so fantastic to be able to see the authors and sort of look to them in their eyeballs and get a sense of what they're like. So please do browse their books, have a look at them. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Actually, I'll ask. Um, could you talk a little bit about cocktails for the book? Oh, yes, indeed. So, you know, what, what I tried to do was to pick out surprising details that you might not know about the authors and to come up with some authors who I really felt ought to be bigger. You know, I could get started about male authors and how much attention they get and how I think women authors should get more attention. Um, but that might be really boring. So, so, but that's part of my thought. You know, there are people in here who are just fine, fine writers and, and really fine people too. You know, some of them I know personally, and I'm just like, you know, the world should know about this. This is really, um, these are good books. Um, so, so that's sort of where it came from. The cocktails, I just love cocktails. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love to put on a big necklace and have a cocktail, and and, and that makes the day for me. It's like, woo! <laughs> and my father's daughter, I suppose. Um, I do try and watch my sugar these days, but however. So, um... An excellent hostess gift for all your summer friends. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that is true. And good for book clubs. And one author in particular I wanted to mention, that for those of you who are writers who are on your way, um, Diana Athill, who's on page four, has just published her latest book. She's 96 years old. Wow. wow. It's called Alive, Alive, O. Oh. <laughs> Appropriate title, but how fantastic. So, so if you're a writer, don't give up. And longevity, that's the key. Um, and we did, I, I test Leslie, who's not here tonight, my dear friend Leslie Papara, we made every single one and tested every one. It was terrible. Having <laughs> <laughs> to do that, you know, but you have to do what you have to do. <laughs> Which one is your favorite? The cocktail. Come on, give us a few of those. <laughs> oh, thank you, Trish. I, well, I do love champagne. I don't, I don't love to drink a lot of it because it gives me heartburn, but there's something about a champagne bottle and the bubbles that just make me think, um, so, I like Catherine Ann Porter's Orange Champagne Punch. I like that one. I like Sangria. That's um, 
on page 57, Chianti Sangria, and they're inspired by um, either elements that were in the story. Sometimes if there was food or drink mentioned, then I took those and used them in the cocktail. Um, sometimes it was thematic. Jane Green, of course, with the Pimps number one classic. Yeah. And there's a video, I interviewed her, and she told me a story about her children when they were quite young, getting into the Pimps <laughs> at a summer party at her house when she was still in England. <laughs> Rolling around, I mean, it's not funny. <laughs> it's really, it's funnier to an English person than it is to me. <laughs> so we have low standards, I'm sorry to say. Um, Juno Diaz, Papi's Rum Punch. If you don't know the story, this is how you lose her. If you don't know that collection, oh my god. The audio, he reads it, it's fantastic. It's mucky. Yeah. It's a 15-year-old boy, you know, some of the reviews on Amazon say we're not, it's swearing and it's all, you know, the sort of thing 15-year-old boys think, so you have to be aware of that. But it's just like traveling to another world is fantastic. Any other questions? Very good. Okay. Yeah.